Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our monthly industry insight with Athlete Soul. We have a great panel this morning. I'm really excited to have um, five awesome uh, lawyers and former athletes joining us for this conversation. Um, in a minute, we're going to talk about who is everybody joining us. But for now, I wanted to give you a few information about this, uh, this webinar this morning. So first of all, the call is recorded as usual. You'll have the recording available after the event, as well as on our website um, later on. Uh, you can ask questions throughout the call. You can do that uh, by writing your question into the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, I will ask those questions to our guests at the end of the, uh, the conversation. Um, and if you uh, want to have more information about Athlete Soul event, you can also visit our website and I'll give you some more information at the end of the call. So today we're going to be talking about the law industry um, and at former athletes working as lawyers or in the law industry. And we're going to get started straight away uh, with introdu in an introduction from each of our speakers. So uh, Whitney, can you, can you get started, please? Thank uh, you. Uh, absolutely. Uh, my name is Whitney Metzler. I was uh, a 1996 Olympic athlete in swimming. Uh, my event was 400 individual medley. Uh, my current job, I am the general counsel and executive director of the House Health Committee here in the state of Pennsylvania. And that means I write all the healthcare laws for the state of Pennsylvania. And I work them through the process, the political process of the House of Representatives. Um, I had a background in medical malpractice. I worked in that for two years. And before that, I did uh, another form of litigation, worker dealer litigation in Manhattan. So I came home to Pennsylvania. I live in the same town I grew up in. Awesome, Whitney. Thank you. And um, we're going to go through a few Olympian on the call today, so it's pretty exciting. Um, we're going to move to another Olympian. Um, Ed, if you can give us uh, your little introduction, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I am the, 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 the um, uh, me. Um, I am Edward um, Nobel. Um, I'm a 1996 uh, track and field um, Olympian uh, from Liberia. Um, I also participated in the 1997 uh, World Championship. Um, uh, um, my uh, sport in 1996 was the 4x100 uh, um, uh, during my time at UNC uh, Chapel Hill, I ran the uh, 400 hurdles as well as the 110 um, high hurdles. Um, currently, um, I reside in uh, Silver Spring, uh, which is right outside of Washington, uh, D.C. Um, I am a solo uh, practitioner we have a staff of uh, six. Um, I've been practicing law for 16 years. Uh, and my um, primary uh, practice is immigration. <laughs> Um, I mean, um, immigration law. Thank you, Ed. Um, and we're moving on to a, um, another 96 Olympian. Uh, Stephen, if you want to give us a, a little bit of your background, please. Sure. My name is Stephen Segaloff. Um, I've been practicing law for about 20 years. I went to law school at the University of Chicago, graduated in 2000. Started off, and I've been a corporate lawyer most of my career. Uh, started off practicing in a big firm in New York City, Cravath, Swain & Moore. Went in-house at a public company, <clears throat> again, doing transactional work. Then I moved in the uh, investment fund world and have been in-house uh, in different forms and fashions of different credit funds, special situations funds. And that's what I do now as I work in-house doing corporate work for a uh, fund called Adewaye Capital Management based in New York. We manage about $6 billion. It's mostly lending work, some real estate, and uh, general corporate work. So look forward to talking to everyone today. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Oh, I didn't say it, though. I was in the sport of rowing. Sorry. I landed there you in go. The sport of rowing, 
Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Rad. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rad Wood, uh, 2002 graduate of Union College. I played football. I was a cornerback back in the day. Um, went on to go to the University of Texas School of Law. I currently practice uh, at a corporate boutique law firm here in Austin, Texas, where UT is located. Before that, I was a, a litigator. I worked at a firm also in Austin called Baker Botts. Um, yeah, that's, that's the, I've been practicing law for 12 years, so. Uh, okay, great, thanks. All right, uh, last speaker, uh, Curtis, with the best background, we love it. <laughs> Yeah, best physical background. I'm incredibly impressed and humbled to be here by all these amazing speakers and athletes. Uh, I walked onto my college lacrosse team and um, I played it back up for a very long time, got a starting position and then blew up my ACL. So um, not as illustrious of a career as some of these other panelists. Um, I played, I ended up playing, uh, I still had a year left, so I played lacrosse uh, at Pepperdine during law school. Um, backgrounds in finance. Um, I worked at Goldman Sachs previous to law school and then um, worked at the SEC, have only been in kind of securities, early stage startups. So that's generally what I work with and whom I work with is just early stage transactional law. So I've um, been practicing for four years now and I run, a, I run my law firm. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And I'm really excited because we have a, a really uh, a wide range of experiences and different type of law that you guys are all practicing. And that's the whole point of this call. So um, as we get started, I'd like to learn more about your path. Um, and it's really to help athletes um, envision what are the different ways to get to where you are in, in different areas of law. So if you can give me more information about uh, what kind of education you had, um, internship, uh, different experiences, and then sort of your different role as you got to uh, your position now. So uh, shall we go through perhaps the same order? Whitney, you want to you wanna get started? Sure. Um, so I have been involved in politics since I was I'd say about 14. Um, my parents were involved in politics, local politics. So I, start, I think that was the first year I worked on a local campaign. Um, I went to law school up in New York. Uh, I had moved there after college at University of Florida. I was a public relations major down there. Um, and my internship for one summer, because I swam every summer, so couldn't do a lot of internships. Um, my internship was actually uh, in government relations here in Harrisburg. So I kind of knew the political process here. As I said, I did do, I worked in a big law. Uh, I worked for Greenberg Traurig in Manhattan when I graduated law school. Um, and that was a great experience, uh, but I had two children in 15 months and it prompted me to move home closer to my parents for, you know, some help with two little very active boys. Um, stayed in litigation um, and I liked medical malpractice. Um, it made sense to me. The number of injuries I had to sustain during my swimming career. Everyone tells you swimming's easy on the joints. They're making that up. Um, so I had major shoulder injuries and I've ACL, I've torn my ACL too, that was skiing, thank you my children. Um, but the, so health was always a natural fit. So when I first got into medical malpractice, um, it was very easy for me to read radiology reports and other uh, medical reports. So that seemed to work really well for me, but when this position opened up at the house, um, it, it gave me a, a better way to help the general public. So right now what I do, I'm surprised, very busy due to this COVID pandemic. Um, so right now I'm writing all the regulations and helping with suspension of regulations to make sure hospitals can respond appropriately to um, needing personal protective equipment um, and those things. So I got into this to make a difference in people's lives. Um, I feel like I do that. Uh, I certainly don't make as much as I did when I was in big law. Um, I went in the reverse. I make less now than I did 15 years ago, um, but I, you know, I, I find my job very interesting. Um, I generally do not know what I'm going to do any day when I walk in. It really depends on what problem had occurred uh, either the day before or the week before that I'm hearing about and that I need to fix on a legislative route or, you know, in some other political method. Can That's you tell us how did your, your school and experiences in law school fall within your, your career, uh, with your swimming career? 
Sure. So um, I, I just went through my undergrad, my mm -hmm. um, junior year and my undergrad, I actually had a career ending shoulder injury. So I stopped swimming then. Um, but being able to swim um, and maintain a really high GPA in my undergraduate was really helpful because when I moved to New York, cost of living is very high. I was on my own. Um, and so I actually went to school at night and worked full time during the day. And that's actually how I, I started in um, with the finance group. So I worked for a financial planning firm and then ultimately moved over to um, Greenberg Traurig as one of their paralegals while I was still financing up law school. So I got, I will willingly admit I got hired because my, uh, the shareholder that hired me um, is a rabid sports fan. And he told me that if I could train for the Olympics, he had no doubt I could learn the, the job that I needed to do there. So um, that opened a door. Um, he still remains one of my closest friends. Um, and, and from that point, I just built my career based on what I knew and, you know, the work ethic that I, you know, developed through swimming. Okay. Yeah. We'll, <clears throat> we'll go, we'll go through that in a minute. Um, Ed, do you want to run us through um, uh, college, law school, and, and sure. what you did after that? Sure, sure. Um, I guess, um, uh, how did I get into the law? Um, it was me, me, my junior year, senior year. Um, I was thinking on what I should do afterwards. Should I go to graduate school? You know, what would be the thing I will, you know, that I would like to do. You know, I loved art, I love history, politics, um, but I realized that I didn't want to get in to go to graduate school and then realized that I felt kind of stuck. And so I, I pondered and thought that, okay, well, the law will provide me with some flexibility in terms of whether I wanted to teach, whether I wanted to practice law, whether I want to do, uh, you know, transactions. And to be frank, I really got into the law because I wanted to travel and I wanted to find something that, that will allow me to travel and work. So I was, my mindset was on the UN, you know, the, you know, doing trade work, contracts, you know, th that was my vision. And so um, getting into law school, um, of course, I hadn't actually seen a real trial or actually been a part of any legal thing, but, you know, I felt that this was, you know, something that I, that, you know, I enjoyed. Um, and my first summer out of school, I came to Washington, D.C. I did a summer at Catholic, I mean, uh, with the Catholic uh, Church doing visas, uh, asylum. And even though based on my background, it wasn't something that I really wanted to do, but I felt like, okay, you know, this is one step in the door just to see how things work. And to my surprise, I enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it because of the different challenges that it posed. You know, one, I got to work on cases from around the world. I got to sitting with clients from diverse backgrounds and it allowed me to begin to see other parts of the world from the client's viewpoint that I didn't quite know about. Um, needless to say, having a background of coming to the US, um, some of the some of the things that you know that kind of also solidify you know why I kind of stuck into this law was that it was the I think 1999 World Championship team. I graduated school and I needed a travel document to be able to leave the U.S. and come back. Well, lo and behold, I'm sitting there waiting for that travel document, and I think the World Championship started like July 26. I get it that very same day. The rest of my teammates had left. And I'm sitting there saying, okay, I can, I can leave, but there are so many immigration complications in terms of getting a visa now and getting this, that I kind of set out. And so that kind of gave me an example of like, okay, you know, you know, maybe I should have hired a lawyer to kind of push this through for me instead of just doing it myself. Um, you know, fast forward um, in 2000, I was training for Sydney and I was out actually looking at law schools to determine when the start date was so that I can gear when the Sydney game started so that I can like skip like the first week of school. So I went uh, to Washington and I mean, um, and I mean, um, and I mean, um, and, um, and there 
uh, first year class started, I think August 28th or September 8th. And so I emailed the uh, dean and said, look, um, would you allow me to skip the first week of law school because I want to go to Sydney? I never got a, a response back from him until I got to the uh, first week and he came up to me and said, hey, you know, we were talking about you traveling, but, you know, we never heard from you. And I'm sitting to myself, well, you, I mean, you never responded back to me. But at the end of the day, I decided not to go to Sydney again because of my visa status and the headaches that would have resulted of being leaving the U.S., getting a visa to, to come back in and all those things. So at the end of the day, it was a visa and also the reality that running track can pay the bills. So I had to make that switch. Um, and after law school, um, I got into this practice group because um, it kind of fell into my lap. I kind of um, continued doing my volunteer work. And once I passed the bar, I told the nonprofit, said, look, if you have clients that can actually pay and can meet your guidelines, send them to me and I'll, you know, do their work permits, their green cards. And since then, um, I haven't stopped. Um, and the most thing that I like about my practice is, is mostly problem solving. I mean, you know, regardless from the, you know, from the athlete who needs a visa to come in to the scientist who needs his green card to the family matter is like every call I get, I kind of joke around and say, it's like, I want, you know, <laughs> you know, there's always like, I need, I want, or this thing comes up, what should I, you know, what should I do? And everything is on the spur of trying to navigate a very tense situation uh, where folks are saying, what's happening to my green card? I can't get a driver's license. I need to work. And being able to tell them, okay, here's what we'll need to do, knowing the hurdles and the hoops that you, that, that you will jump through. Those are kind of things that it's also stressful, but I enjoy it because Every day there's a new twist and turn, uh, you know, that you experience. Yeah, a very uh, personal inspired journey. Um, and something I can relate to, I actually set out one world championship because I didn't have my citizenship at the time. So I can relate to what you just said. Um, Steven, you want to go through your, your class as well and how it fitted with your, uh, your sporting career? Yeah, sure, happy, thanks. <clears throat> so I graduated college in 1992. Uh, and expected I would stop competing at that time. I actually took a I thought I would be a lawyer, so I moved to Washington, D.C. and spent uh, the first year or nine months after I graduated working on Capitol Hill. Um, I actually worked for then Senator Joe Biden on the Judiciary Committee. It's a long time ago. Um, so I expected I would go to law school at that time after spending a couple years on Capitol Hill, but Shortly after I started working, I had an opportunity to go back to the sport of rowing. So I ended up doing that full time um, and put off law school for three and a half years of training. So I went through the whole quadrennial on the national team rowing and training for a while. <clears throat> Once I finished in Atlanta, I was ready. Well, I wasn't ready, but it was time to, I figured at 20, whatever, six years old, time to get my first real job or close to it. So I took uh, the LSATs and went through the process and went to law school. At that point, I effectively followed the traditional path in the sense of went to law school for three years. I had an internship. You know, my first summer was with a corporate firm in Chicago. I was going to law school in Chicago. Second summer was an internship at, uh, at a firm in New York City, the same firm I ended up starting at in the corporate department there. So I really just progressed. Um, in that sense. And then, you know, my various jobs have always been different iterations of corporate work, either in-house or at law firms advising corporate clients. So once, once the rowing ended, it was pretty much standard, uh, standard legal stuff. I would echo what Whitney said. <clears throat> um, I'm certain I was the only Olympian in my law school class getting an interview at Cravath, which is a difficult place to get an interview. Having an Olympic resume made a huge difference. Um, people kind of didn't believe it, so to speak. It turned out, I think there were actually 
there were at least two and maybe three Olympians working at Cravath at the time, which was sort of weird. We had like a New Zealand sprinter and it was someone else, I think. But it obviously, I think competing at sports at a high level is a, is a pretty good way to differentiate yourself from the, you know, run of the mill law school candidate or uh, lawyer. Absolutely. And I think it's such a competitive industry. Uh, you know, even though you say you have a traditional path and there's nothing traditional about achieving the Olympics by 20 years old, 25 years old, and then <laughs> moving into law, law and, and a law career. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, Rad, can you uh, tell us about your, your journey? Sure. You know, I think for me, I didn't have like a burning desire to be an attorney, right? I was, I was just in college. And to be frank, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a political science major. I was really interested in politics and policy. Uh, it's probably the, tr like, the most common background you have before you go to law school. And I, I didn't have anything really lined up. Um, actually, I took my, my last semester of college off and started working for a law firm so that I could come back in the fall semester and be a grad assistant on the football team and apply for some like post-grad scholarships um, uh, and different fellowships. I didn't end up getting any of those, but I was able to stick around the football team for a year longer, like coach, get that other perspective, um, and then continued working at that law firm that I had started working at. So that was kind of my first taste of practicing a firm. It was a small boutique uh, plaintiff and criminal defense firm in upstate New York where I was going to, col or to college at the time. Um, I also did an internship at the AG's office in New York State when I was at Union, the college I was going to. So I was doing these different things along the way that kind of, I guess, would lead you to a legal career, but it wasn't necessarily intentional. Um, you know, kind of like Ed, when I was thinking about the law, I was thinking, like, I'd really love to do something international, like the UN, like uh, human rights law, things like that nature. Um, but after undergrad, I had an opportunity to go work at the district attorney's office in Manhattan. Um, and so I worked there as a paralegal, called ourselves trial preparation assistants, uh, for two years postgraduate after my kind of year at extra union coaching, and then got into UT to go to law school in Texas. And at that point in time, I actually quit my job at the DA's office and then traveled uh, throughout the Middle East for six months, uh, Lebanon and, and Syria and Jordan. It's my first time to really like leave the country and really experience different cultures. Um, and then came back and had to jump into to going to law school. So my path to law school wasn't necessarily direct, but uh, it got me there. And then when I was there, I was still thinking kind of like, yeah, I'm gonna do these like international things and all this other stuff. But I did really well. And I realized that I had a ton of debt after the first year. Um, and so, when the interview started coming up, I started getting offers. You know, I, I, I summered at Skadden in New York City and I summered at Baker Botts in Austin. And they're paying you a lot of money and you're looking at how much you owe. And you're like, I really just need to do this to, to pay off this debt. Uh, so I, I did that and, and I actually am very thankful for it. I ended up choosing uh, Baker Botts in Austin, uh, worked in their commercial litigation department for four years. That trained me up in a way that I, I wouldn't have gotten otherwise, right? Just these like lawyers that are, have been doing it forever that have, you know, endless amounts of money from their clients to do the very best job possible. Um, and so you just work on an issue until you get it right. And then they're just ripping your work apart and telling you how bad you are until you get better at it. Um, which is from an athlete's perspective was great. You know, I'm used to coaches kind of telling you when you do something wrong in a very direct way. So I think that, that kind of helped me. Um, but again, I didn't really know that that, that wasn't, didn't kind of fit right, that type of law. So again, I, I left uh, after about four years, did a bunch more traveling, uh, came back, basically hung a shingle, tried to like build my own practice, uh, reconnected with a friend from law school. And he had been doing, you know, early stage venture work for startups. And that sounded very interesting to me. It was something very different than I had ever done before. But I jumped into that and have been doing that now for um, four or five years. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 I would say that the life experiences in sport and then even travel helped me with like Baker Botts, with Skadden, with my new career, just those kind of things that stick out from maybe the run and mill candidates. If you, uh, you know, played college athletics or were traveling to a country when it was bombed by someone, which happened to me, like it becomes the conversation that people talk about in those interview processes, right? Yeah. 
And, and I really like to hear all of your experiences because it's, um, it shows that you can have different paths that can actually work in color, in, um, uh, with your career as an athlete um, and do different experiences as you go to college and then to law school and try to like um, make it work with a sporting career somehow uh, up until law school, law school at least. Um, Curtis, do you want to give us the, uh, the outline of your journey? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I don't know if this was similar experience to anybody listening or, or on the panel, but kind of when college athletics ended it was a real kind of blow especially with that ending and school ending as well and so a lot of like pieces of I feel like my identity were just like removed and then it's like well who am I now um so I kind of really struggled with that like right after college um I jumped in working in like a small law firm while I was studying for the LSAT I did some like domestic traveling just around the U.S. a little bit and then um I, I it, was, it was a small like three or four attorney shop didn't really love it um, I, my first interview out of college, somebody said like, you're going to be really bad at interviewing when you do your first interview. And I was like, not me. And then I got my first interview out of college at Goldman Sachs. I did really bad at it. Um, so I took every opportunity to interview at like 20, 30, 40 different places, like places I didn't want to work at. Um, but I just interviewed, kept interviewing, kept interviewing. So like when I was working at the small law firm, I got another, I got a call back from Goldman. I was like, well, I have to interview now. And I just, I crushed it. I knew I did well. I was like, I know all the answers to these questions. Like I've done this so many times that I know I can do well at it. So I got that job. Um, and making the decision, I, I did fairly well on the LSAT. In my last semester of college, after I tore my ACL, I'd actually done two internships, one at a startup and one at like a bond trading desk. Um, and I realized kind of like, I didn't really want to work at like a big bureaucratic firm. Um, and so I love this like ski and snowboard shop. It was a ski and snowboard apparel. That they made, we made like beanies and hats and clothes. And I love just like the every all hands on deck, like get it done approach. Um, and so then naturally I jumped into a big gigantic bureaucratic firm um, at Goldman after. And I actually really, really enjoyed it. I'm from Idaho originally. I worked in Salt Lake and Goldman was just like the most diverse, like, thinking people like cultural experiences a place that I'd ever been which seems a bit ironic I guess but I loved it loved the vibe just loved the hard work that like it was just that energy being around like people who know how to get everything done and you can trust everyone who's like being on a team again so um I really really enjoyed it and so making the decision to jump to law school was a really big one for me um I got a full ride to Pepperdine so I was actually in a really like um, still kind of thinking about opportunity costs and whether, what, where could I be a VP by this time, blah, blah, blah. But, um, I made the decision to move out. It was an opportunity to move out to California and I'd always kind of wanted to be out here. So, um, I took it and absolutely just like fell in love with California. So I worked so hard my first semester. I'm, I'm, I'm sure all the other panels can tell you it's terrifying your first semester. All they do is scare you, um, to just like work, work. And so um, again, my brother-in-law had told me, he's like, you're probably gonna have to work like 50 or 60 hours a week. And I was like, not me. And then I got into it and I was like, yep, me too. Um, and I ended up getting a 4.0 in my first semester of law school. So I was in a really good position. I think I was like the second or third ranked law student. Um, I got a little bit cocky in my second semester and I went to Coachella and I like didn't study as hard. So I slipped a little bit, but I still graduated in the top 10%. Um, and during law school, my Pepperdine has a lot of international programs, so um, I figured I would take advantage of some of those, so I left, uh, because I know a lot of athletes either listening could never do the, um, the study abroad when they're in school, and I was so jealous of all the people they could, so when the opportunity came up in law school, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it, um, so I went to Uganda for two months and worked for their version of the Securities and Exchange Commission, um, and then I moved directly from Uganda to London, so I was gone for like eight months, and I figured I'll just be gone for these eight months. And then I'll never need to leave the U.S. again. Um, and it sounds like some other people caught the travel bug. I definitely caught it. I, um, so I it was gone for those eight months, came back to the U.S. and was like, well, how do I get, how do I leave again? Um, and I did an uh, internship with a medium-sized law firm my second semester. Um, worked at a like Series D startup um, during law school. I kind of tried to just take every opportunity to see what I, what I did and didn't want to do. Um, moved to DC my last semester of law school, which was a big move, and worked just full time at the SEC. Um, they had like a study of like domestic 
a broad program where you could take a couple classes. So I did that my last semester and was just working like 40 hours a week there um, to kind of see, I was in the division of trading markets and I was like one of the first people to look into crypto, um, which is, they were, they were like, who's this weird kid who likes the, all these like strange financial products. I was on the division of trading markets. So all of the ones that were like, they were just like interesting new products that came through. Um, and then after, after I graduated, one of my best friends asked me if I wanted to study for the bar in the Caribbean. So I went there and did like a, I studied abroad or I studied for the bar just doing an online test prep um, for Themis. And we probably studied way too hard, but I was like, definitely not going to be the guys that leave um, and move to St. Martin and then fail the bar. So came back, took the bar and then took the remaining money I had um, from the bar loan and just left for like, uh, with DC and then the Caribbean and then after like a year, just over a year, and then I came back to LA um, and I started my own law firm. I kind of got the four hour work week mindset. And so how could I start a firm that um, allows me to like still do other things? And like, is there a white space for people who need help, but don't necessarily need a thousand dollar an hour um, attorney, but need a little bit more than legal zoom can provide. So I figured there was some white space in there. So I kind of used my business background to, um, to get in there and just like help early stage startups. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what led me here. So that was three and a half years ago and I hung out my own shingle. That's awesome. Uh, thank you all for like sharing your past in detail, because I think for the student athlete or athlete that's still in school right now, um, it's really important to see there are many ways to get to, to your point. Um, and there's different ways that will fit your version, version of success, you know? So everybody has um, a, a different opportunity to make their, their own journey and their own path. Um, so this is a question for, for all of you guys. Um, and it, it still relate, we, we talked about education and in, in sort of the past to, to uh, becoming a lawyer. Um, is it possible to attend law school and still compete as an athlete? Or do you think, uh, you know, you're done with your undergrad and then after that, um, if you decide to go to law school, that's sort of it from a sporting career. Um, just trying to give the athletes here an understanding of, of what to expect, the amount of work that's required and whether it's at all compatible with a sporting career still. Anybody you wanna? get started uh, i can jump in um i after under undergrad ended i realized you don't get as many opportunities to like play sport um so i like played basketball with the guys like once a week from goldman and like you never get that same like competitive like drive as you do in undergrad and like love that missed it i don't know how many other athletes felt like that but i really missed it so um, and you just don't really get that same like competitiveness in everyday life. So when I got to law school and found out there was a 2L who was playing, um, who was playing on the lacrosse team, I was like, how do I get to do that? And then being back on the college campus was absolutely amazing for me because there were so many like intramurals and things going on all the time that took advantage of. Um, I don't think you ever get kind of the same. Um, I don't think you get the same like being back into it. I mean, I tried doing CrossFit, I tried doing like now I play on like two different men's team and like an intramural soccer team and I coach for the, the JV team at El Segundo, but I don't think you ever get back to that. Um, so I, my advice would be to really enjoy it and cherish it, even though really hard workouts and hard, like hard days and times, um, because it's, it's tough to get back to that same competitiveness, but I don't think it ever goes away. I don't think you ever, uh, like and you can get tastes and glimpses of it. And mm -hmm. Like. Whitney, you were gonna say something. Do you think you could have pursued swimming and, and continue to be in law? Uh, could I? I could have practiced, um, but the travel schedule is what I think would, would yeah. really lead to be a problem. Um, I don't know though. I mean, let's in the last year, so many things have gone virtual. Um, I don't know what schools look like now. Um, you know, my job. I used to have to be in the Capitol every day. Now they've come to the realization over the last six months that I can do my job virtually. Um, and so I think we're pro athletes now will probably have a better chance. Uh, but it was interesting, like no one in my law school class could compete for Pace. Uh, Pace is the law school I went to. They do have an undergrad um, in Manhattan, just outside of Manhattan. So there would have been the opportunity to potentially uh, compete for them if you still had eligibility. 
I actually still have a year of eligibility if I chose to ever go back to school. I don't ever plan to. I'm done. But um, the I, I think it would have been difficult back when most of us went to law school. Maybe that's changing though, simply because of the you know the necessary changes of making things so much more virtual and and the acceptance of Zoom meetings and everything else that we're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's more flexibility at, at the school, you know, the school level, um, but it certainly would be quite a, a big challenge uh, for anybody to study law school and then try to compete, especially, I guess, if you're in a, in a team sport. I would imagine if you're on your own, it's probably a little easier, but even so, that's a lot of work. Um, Ed, do you, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean... I would say for my first year, I had this idea that maybe I, uh, that I had the chance to still train. Um, what I found from them, at least for the first semester, I still sort of maintain that same uh, regimen, but it just didn't feel the, the, the same. You know, the competitive spirit, um, you know, it felt a little bit that I was trying too hard. But also with the schedule that, that I had, you had to um, devote a certain amount of time, you know, to, you know, reading your schoolwork. And if you balance that with the amount of practice, weights, rest that you need, I mean, at a certain point you can push it, but then, you know, once the travel schedule gets involved, then you start realizing, well, you know, you know, which one will have to suffer. Um, and, you know, so, you, you know, you, you have to kind of decide. Now, I do know of, uh, I do know of, uh, of a long jumper that I, I believe he went to Harvard and he competed and trained. So maybe it's possible uh, to be done. I mean, there's always, you know, that, that you can do, but I think also where you are, I mean, if you are at a place where you have a large uh, support system, then you can easily, you know, mesh and, you know, remain part of that network. Um, but I think at some point you have to kind of decide uh, what do you want to do because the law is also demanding. Uh, and if you want to be at the same level as you are with your sport, um, I guess you can be that one, but, but certain parts of your other life may have to give way. So you have to look at, you know, are you single, you're married, do you have kids, you know, what are, what's your status in life at this time uh, to maintain those two intensity, you know, intense um, uh, paths. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, another way to, to perhaps consider it is also what Steven's done and taking a break and uh, compete full time and then go back to a, a career. Um, you guys have all had various experiences, um, internship and acquaintances with the law sort of before, during and, and after you went to law school. And so do you think that's uh, uh, necessary, first of all, um, at the undergrad level? And is it a good way for an athlete to sort of figure out which which side of law they want to go into and whether this is for them or not. Um, can you talk a little bit through um, those experiences? I, I know, Rad, you mentioned a few things while you were still in college. Um, do you think that's important for, for athletes to consider as they prepare for the next phase? I think it's always good. I think internships, I think anything that kind of gives you more experience will help you in the interview process, will help kind of distinguish you from other candidates. I hesitate to say that it has like a direct effect on your ability to like really learn a lot about what that practice of law is because the practice of law is so unique to the attorneys that are practicing it versus the support staff. You know, my experience as a paralegal at the DA's office, I got to see generally what criminal law was like. I got to help out but my, what I did on a day-to-day -day was vastly different than the attorneys that were actually, you know, arguing hearings and trials and looking up case law, you know, that it's just, you know, it's just so unique in that way. I think that what I liked about the different experiences and internships that I had was that it just increased my network. I got mm -hmm. to meet a lot of interesting people. I got to be, become a part of their community. They cared about me and, and my future because of that um, and would be willing and 
to open up further doors for me. So I, I think in that regard, those experiences are very valuable. Got it. Um, anybody want to chim in on the uh, on experiences of volunteer experience, um, Stephen? I'll do that. Um, I think you know the key is to get experience in any form or fashion, right? Get your hands dirty and learn about things and be around things that you like or you think you want to do, whether that's an internship or a straight up job or just shadowing people or learning about it. I think Rad makes the right point. You know, being a paralegal doesn't teach you how to be a lawyer because you're not necessarily a lawyer. You kind of see how it's made, mm -hmm. but you're ancillary to it, so to speak. Um, but, you know, anything you want to accomplish in the law, the best thing to do is to get as close possible to, you can to it and see what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. I, I think just speaking from a corporate law perspective, it's really hard to know what corporate law is about unless you're there doing it. You know, you don't, even if you're taking finance and corporate classes in law school, you don't really know how to do a deal until you're doing a deal. Um, and, you know, these days you can probably get a lot closer to it than you could have 20 years ago with the advent of things like Shark Tank and all the entrepreneurial spirit that's, I think, a lot more prevalent today than it was, like, I don't want to sound like an old person, but like when I was doing this 20 years ago. But I think you can get involved with young companies, small companies. There's lots of ways to get around and get involved things to learn skills. And if you're a business person starting up a business, you need to raise money, you need to have a term sheet, you need to execute documents. That's as good as being a lawyer. It's probably better than being a paralegal in terms of experience you're getting. Uh, probably a lot better. So, you know, even on the business side, you are in the legal side, you might find that that's more appealing or less appealing. And those roles tend to be kind of fungible from a business or legal perspective. So, you know, to me, the net of it is if you find something you're passionate about, then you should get as close to it and work with people and seek out people in today's society with LinkedIn and so forth. It's easy to reach out and find things you like and people you like and people are pretty responsive. So I'd encourage folks to dig in that way. Um, and I guess maybe just to tie it back, not to talk too long, but to tie it back to the previous discussion, I think it's hard, if you want to be really good at something, I think it's hard to be good at two things at the same time. That's not to say you couldn't train to be a good long jumper, but if you want to go to the Olympics in the long jump, you're probably not working at SCAD and, and training to be in the Olympics in the long jump. That's not going to happen. So if you want to be a top lawyer, you do that a lot. If you want to be a top long jumper, you do that a lot. And that's my personal philosophy absolutely um so so you guys talked about we talked about your past um your experiences um can you tell me um what you think you've transferred from your career as an athlete into what you do now like is are there specific skills and perhaps a little bit deeper than just thinking of resiliency or resiliency or hard work or, or teamwork or the things that we used to hear um, is there, are there any other transferable skills that you feel you've moved over from your sport into your career now? Um, Curtis, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think there's a reason why people say like the hard work and the discipline, um, because it's true. I mean, those, those are the most transferable skill sets. Like, as unfortunate as, as it is, there's not as many transferable skill sets to drafting a document as there are to like playing a sport. Like there just, there isn't, I wish there was more. Um, but like the, the easiest and most obvious ones are definitely the hard work discipline. Like, and then I would say uh, one thing that maybe gets overlooked is communication, um, is being able to be like really empathetic and a good listener. Um, and to kind of know what's going on around you and especially in, in any sort of deal making um, because there are team elements to it. And so reading situations and reading people and like, I think that's something that isn't really necessarily labeled as much in sports, but is especially in team sports, but is super, super important that like kind of communication without words. And I think that you, there's a lot of those pieces that go on. So um, in whatever sense, um, I think emotional intelligence and empathy, whatever you can develop on the field is going to make your game way better. And then what you can bring into whatever field, whether it's law or anything else, if you can bring those, even in your personal life, I think it's going to improve it. Love it. Whitney is, wants to talk. Absolutely. Go for it. 
Well, I think this was mentioned by somebody before, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to attribute it correctly, but the ability to take criticism and rather harsh criticism um, pretty well. Um, as I said earlier, I work in politics. It's really not a nice place most times. Even if you work for a party, they're really not nice to you either. Um, so to be able to, to also explain where you're coming from, um, explain how the person you're talking to is incorrect. Um, I, that was both when I did medical malpractice and now in politics. Um, telling a doctor what they did isn't the best thing and trying to change internal policies in a hospital is one of the more difficult things and doing that when you're a woman and in your late 20s was rather interesting. Um, but being yelled at, to be quite candid, um, and belittled and not take that personally um, did come from years and years of not the best coaches. Luckily, I ended up with some really great coaches, but we all know that there were bad coaches back in the 90s and, and belittling was the way to motivate most athletes. So um, I think that's, that's changing a little bit. The um, mentality behind that changes a little bit, but really not taking things personally because they're not intended to be personal um, in this profession, at least coming from a younger woman, <laughs> now in my 40s, so I guess I'm not that much younger, but coming out through my career, um, you know, I, I people will always ask me, I did, bro I represented brokers, doctors, and now politicians, so like that's really a wide range of professions. What's the unifying theme? I'm like, usually it's men with egos. Um, and being able to deal with them in a manner that uh, lets them know that you're not, you know, threatened by them, but that you can explain your position and get them to understand and potentially change theirs to improve outcomes. It, it was probably one thing I got from swimming more than anything else. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, so, it sounds like this is all related to that, that communication skill, um, whether, you know, it's being yelled at or not. Um, but you definitely got tougher skin from your coaches, it seems, and that you translated that. Um, we, it's actually a common theme that we got from a lot of athletes is being able to be coachable, to take criticism well and use it to fuel yourself um, into your career. Uh, it seems that's something that the athlete can do really well. Um, Ed, did, were you going to say something as well? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, basically what I was touching on is that, I mean, if you look at the world and you look at the athletes, I mean, there, there's a small percentage of folks that will have done what we have achieved, you know? And that's not to say, you know, that we are a special kind, but when you're in law, at least the way how I look at it now is that, um, you know, you can have one person who have one great race and they will never have that uh, chance, you know, to race again. But then you have someone who comes back and over and over runs at that same level. And I think in law, this is what's required where you come over and over and you have that consistency where your clients and your boss, your partners can expect that this person has that drive, that stamina, that every day they will come in and put in the necessary work and skills. Um, we all have seen colleagues or friends who are talented but just didn't have that stamina to, you know, go through. And in the law, at least when I started up, I looked or I found maybe two or three models and I looked at them and say, okay, you know, this is someone that I admire. This is someone that writes well. How can I learn from that person? Um, and what can I do to improve my skills? Um, and you have to be humble. You know, and the reason why I believe law firms look at athletes is because, I mean, to be frank, when, when I was in law school and I went to the firms and it was sit down and talk to me, I had no idea about mergers, acquisitions. 
I mean, I th looking back, I should have just said, I don't have any idea what you do, but I'm willing to learn and I have to drive, you know? But during those periods of time, and I always asked myself, they always wanted to talk about how was track and field, how was the Olympics. And I'll always kind of just brush it off like, look, you know, this is what I want to tell you about, you know, how smart I am. But I guess what they were getting at is trying to see that passion and that zeal and how that would translate to the culture. And looking back 16, 20 years, if I were to go back to law school and I was looking for a job, I would sit there and talk about my experience in sports, how that made me strong and how I'm willing to learn. Because to be honest, I mean, now that I look at stuff, I said, I had no concept what a startup or a mergers or what I was talking about. I mean, you know, so, you know, you have to be humble and I think know that you don't know and you're willing to learn. And even in my practice, when I have second years come on, I tell them, I said, look, what I do, you have no idea what I'm doing. What I need you to do right now is research and write. Research, write, read cases. And they're like, well, and I'm like, research, write, read cases and learn how to talk to the clients. Because nine times out of 10, your success at any law firm will depend on your interaction with clients and how they relate to you. And that brings in business. And if you bring it in business, the partners love you and you're making money. <laughs> so it is my plan. I love what you said, Ed, because um, this is actually what we do in one of our, our career accelerator program at Athlete Soul is, is tell athletes to be um, an advocate of a self advocate using their sports. So you want to use example, clear example from your sport on how you tackle a problem, find solution and overcome challenges using example of your sport, because this is what you have at 23. You have, you know, 10, 15, 20 years of, of playing your sport and plenty of example to use rather than trying to be smart at the industry that you're going to get into where most of the time you know nothing about. So I thought that was a great example. Um, I, I'm going to move a little bit from all of those great skills that you guys have transferred, but can you tell us uh, pretty candidly, you know, what's the biggest challenge to expect when you get into, into law? Um, something that you would have liked someone to tell you before you got into it, or we want to try to depict a clear picture for everybody here. So um, anything that comes to mind? Steven, anything? Sure. I'd actually pick up on something Ed just said, which is you're not going to know a lot of things, and you have to know that it's okay to not know things. You're allowed to ask questions. Probably not allowed to ask the same question like four times over four transactions, for example, or four situations. But I think it's perfectly acceptable, you know, when you're starting off in law, there's, you don't know anything. You don't know anything. I mean, certainly on the corporate side, again, I think you come out of law school, you know nothing about how to do a deal, probably. So you're gonna have to learn it, and you're gonna have to ask a lot of questions. And even after you do it once, you're gonna have to kind of refine it and figure it out. So I think it's perfectly okay to know nothing and come into it realizing they need to learn you go so I think that's the thing is you know when you finish law school at best you're probably 25 years old um, you probably think you know everything you, you definitely don't so you're really starting at ground zero stage one I think it's better to go into it with that attitude that hey my cup is empty I'm gonna fill it up with all the water I can to learn as opposed to thinking you know what you're doing and you know you're gonna figure stuff out so I think you really have to kind of uh, going with that attitude and I think you'll be in a much better position as opposed to putting the pressure on yourself to thinking that you should know everything you need to know on day one. And lawyers can be scary. I think many lawyers feel like once they've done things, it's great to boss around other people. Um, kind of how Whitney made the point earlier before. And I, I think that's all nonsense, you know, as long as you have a good head on your shoulders and you think, uh, you know, you're, you're thoughtful about your job and ask the right questions and be diligent, then you're you're set to succeed from there. Thanks, Stephen. That, that, was, that was great addition. And um, you did not tell me what was your biggest challenge, but we're going to get into that. Oh, in my minutes. biggest challenge? <laughs> what's, what was my biggest challenge? 
in my law practice. Um, I think the biggest challenge was I didn't want to stay at a law firm and I wanted to go in-house and be on the client side and that's not an easy thing to do. You certainly can't start from that position because companies don't want to hire someone to teach them. They want someone who's already, you know, knows what they need to do. So the, it's a, it's a different, it's a harder shift to go from a law firm into an in-house position and those jobs tend to be harder to get. So that was the biggest challenge that I've faced is finding a position in-house at a company where I could be, I like to be, uh, you know, it, there's two sides of it. There's the client making the phone call and there's the lawyer receiving it, the law firm. I prefer to make the phone call rather than receive it. Um, and that's a hard, it was harder for me to make that transition. So that was my biggest challenge. Great, thanks. I didn't mean to push you into that. <laughs> um, um, we, we only have a few minutes left, so I'd like to hear back from um, all of you on your biggest challenge and, and any further recommendation that you have uh, for athletes that want to that get into law. Um, Brad, yep. Sure. I think the biggest challenge that I've discovered with law was um, it's very stressful. Like you hear, you, they, they put you through all these programs when you're in law school that talk about how lawyers drink and do drugs at higher rates than most of the rest of the country and have higher rates of depression. And you're like, oh, you know, to Curtis said, really like, oh, that's not going to be me. And then you get in it and you're like, oh, this is really stressful. I understand why some of my colleagues are doing these things, right? And I think particularly for an athlete where we are, you know, everyone here is extremely intelligent. And so we have the cerebral side, but if you're an athlete, you've had that physical side your whole life which has probably been some sort of an outlet, some sort of a stress reliever and finding that time to continue to be in your body, like physically move and do those things that are healthy for you can get pushed to the side when you have just demanding clients and deadlines and stuff like that. And you get really stressed out and you get burnt out real easy. So I think it's super important to try and find the time to still be an athlete, keep healthy, because if not, you know, law is a client driven business and they become kind of the bosses and they will push you and take as much as you'll give them. So you kind of have to have like strong boundaries around that yourself. Cause if you don't set those up, you know, you'll, you'll run yourself ragged. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I know we didn't touch on this uh, very much. So thank you for adding that. Um, Curtis, any further recommendation? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, I'm not sure if any of the other lawyers would agree with this, but like when you get, when you go through law school, kind of, it, it forces you into one model and law, the law school model hasn't really changed. So it like spits out, not even on the transactional side, like it more so is like geared towards litigation and it's spitting out these like, this is what you should do and you should jump into a big law firm and this is like your next step. And like, that's definitely the right path for a lot of people, but figuring out what was, I mean, kind of to what Rod was saying and finding out like, those stress re relievers and what's right for you. I think that was a really tricky one for me because I think I went into law school kind of knowing that. And then you get caught up in this race um, of like what I should do and comparing yourself on like either a money perspective or a time perspective or this like intellectual challenge eliteness game of like, well, who's the smartest, who's the best? Like, and, and I think it's really, really easy, especially if you're an athlete to get very caught up in that because we're used to competing. And law school forces you to directly compete, which I think you excel in some ways because of that. But um, I think one of my biggest challenges was narrowing in on what was the right thing for me, not the right thing for somebody else. And like telling my career counselor, like, look, I'm not going to go to a big law firm. Like that's, I know that's not the right move for me. Um, that was, that was a, a, a challenge. And so I think um, knowing how to stay enough within the bounds and operate and learn and be coachable and like have connections and then but also being not being afraid to like forge your own path a little bit i think that's uh that's can be a really really tricky one um and finding out the right balance um between work and hours and pay and and like where you're at um so yeah thank you curtis for adding that because i think it's a really important message to find you know what's the right balance for yourself and and where do you fit in um ed any any further recommendation and then we'll finish with whitney after that yeah uh, same here uh you know the law is uh, stressful i mean at least for me from my end uh my biggest challenge was of course uh in the first few years trying to run a law practice uh and kind of understanding 
the financial side of things and how to properly navigate those, um, uh, to navigate those, uh, those situations. Mm -hmm. Also to be able to deal with clients, you have to have this perspective knowing that if a client calls you and they're upset, uh, as much as you are trying to explain or say, you know, that's not my fault, there's a way how you can kind of calm them down and kind of like redirect. And it takes a certain level of hum uh, being humble and patience to be able to, you know, redirect and be able to, you know, just kind of calm things down and figure out things out. So that's very uh, challenging because in as much as you're also dealing with the stresses of, you know, work, you also have to be able to uh, articulate to the client in a very uh, non-legal way what's going on um, or else, you know, they're going to come back and say, well, you're not, you know, we don't see any progress. At least in my practice group, you know, when I started off, there was a lawyer that told me and said, look, Ed, you can write the best brief ever. This client just wants a work permit. They don't care about the folk circus said this, they just want a work permit. And at the end of the day, you know, you gave that client that work permit or, or that visa, you become the hero. I mean, I mean, the level of he's the greatest versus, well, how about my brief, you know? So it's it, it just being able to um, be able to translate your legal work and be able to explain it to the client and, and balance all those factors. And like a rat said, you know, during this pandemic, I mean, I've worked harder and I can see how people, uh, lawyers can get easily slip into just having a drink here and there, you know, having this here and there, because it's not like you're going out to start drinking, but sooner or later, you know, you're sitting there and all you want is just one hour of just downtime where you can just forget about anything before looking at your phone for the next, oops, what's going on? I mean, it's just, that. so you need some outlet, you need to run, you need to get out, you need to do your sport, you need to connect with your family. And those things can be easily lost with this pace of becoming the best, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, it's a very competitive industry, stressful. Uh, but I really like that you guys are all highlighting fine people skills um, and, and communication skills. I think it's really important. Uh, Whitney, any la last word? Oh, this might be a challenge based on your sport. Um, so swim with swimming, the easiest way to determine whether you're getting better or not is by looking at the clock. Um, so all of my goal setting for the majority of my life was time based. Uh, did I drop time? Did I add time? Um, there's nothing that is that quantifiable, at least in my practice area. Uh, I could review a thousand documents, that's not going to make a hill of beans. Um, building off what Ed said, it's whether you get that work permit or not, uh, whether you get that piece of legislation signed into law or not. Um, and sometimes you don't have control over you don't have control over the ancillary things. Um, so it was really trying to uh, readjust your goal setting and understand that your goals may not be your client's goals um, and you're working for the client. So at the end of the day, you have to adopt whatever the client's end goal is. Uh, get a company started, get a work permit, get a piece of legislation done. So it's adjusting your goal setting um, for something, at least for me, that wasn't perfectly quantifiable. That, that took a little bit of a struggle um, and that was probably my biggest challenge coming into the legal profession. Yeah, and I think that would be a, an adjustment for quite some athletes actually, not just in the legal field, but, but having to realize that you need to be more outward um, in, in serving others while you do your work rather than just yourself um, or your team on the sports side. Um, guys, so we, we actually run out of time. I uh, wanted to thank you a lot for the conversation. Um, this was really insightful and, and, and lots of information for everybody. And you've had such great and different experiences that um, I think it made the conversation really interesting. Um, so thank you again for your time. For everybody that joined, you'll have this uh, video available um, shortly after today and on our website as well. And you can visit our website at um, 3wathletesoul.space slash events if you're interested in, in any of these, um, these industry insight events as well as um, educational events as well. Um, so thank you all 
and uh, I wish you all a, a great day. Thanks. Thank you very you much. Guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.